All right, why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, all right, so welcome everyone to And Then They Were Gone, Teenagers of People's Temple from High School to Jonestown, which is a virtual talk with their San Francisco teacher, Judy Bebelar. Am I pronouncing your name right, Judy? Bebelar, but that's- Bebelar, I just realized, I didn't ask me, you that. <laughs> the kids called me Miss B, because nobody pronounces it right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, my name, my name, so Judy Bebelar will be our uh, speaker tonight. Um, she has a lot of great stories to share with you. My name is Taryn Edwards, and I am one of the librarians here uh, at the Mechanics Institute of San Francisco. For those of you who are unfamiliar with mechanics, we are an independent membership organization that houses a wonderful library, uh, the oldest designed to serve the public, in fact, not just mechanics. Um, we're also a cultural event center and we host all kinds of fun activities like this. And we are the oldest chess club in the nation uh, that has been in continuous operation. Um, right now, due to our shelter in place, almost all of our activities are virtual, but I encourage you to consider becoming a member with us. It's only $120 a year, and with that you help support our contribution to the literary and cultural world of the San Francisco Bay Area. So Judy Bibelar and her co-author Ron Cabral were both instructors at Opportunity High School. Uh, which was a public alternative school in San Francisco. Uh, when, uh, in September of 1976, uh, Jim Jones enrolled all the Temple teenagers there. So now Judy is a poet and an author. Uh, her work has appeared in over 50 literary journals and she's published three anthologies. And currently she co-hosts a monthly reading series with the Bay Area Writing Project. Um, so the way it's going to work tonight is I'm going to show a brief film trailer uh, about the book and then Judy will give us a talk and then we'll take questions. So please post those in the chat space and then we'll make every effort to uh, answer them. Judy, do you have anything you want to say before we before I share my screen and show the video? I think I'm ready to start. Great. Okay. Um, let me just do that here. And all righty. How is this looking? When we speak of Jonestown, we speak of Kool Aid, of Jim Jones and the babies who were murdered first. We speak of we don't have the visual of yeah the sure enough hang on one second there we go let's share the right screen all right all right so we want to share this screen hang on it's not letting me share let's try this again All right. Does that look good, Judy? Yes. Perfect. Mm -hmm. When we speak of Jonestown, we speak of Kool-Aid, of Jim Jones and the babies who were murdered first. We speak of cults with messianic leaders. We rarely speak of the individual victims, and we never speak of the teenagers, high school students with dreams beyond Jonestown who died in what some call a massacre. In their book, And Then They Were Gone, Judy Bibelar and Ron Cabral tell the stories of these young adults who were students of theirs at Opportunity High in San Francisco. They share their poetry, their crushes, and most importantly, their hopes for the future. In the late 70s, Jim Jones created a settlement in the Guianese jungle to serve as a model system live freely without bias. But by 1977, when most of their students arrived, 
Jonestown had become a jungle prison camp with mandatory hard labor and harsh punishments. And then on November 18th, 1978, 918 Americans died after ingesting flavor aid laced with cyanide, one third of them under 18. Some called it mass suicide, others called it murder. They were not zombie followers. Instead, they were terrified and hopeless, trapped by the jungle without their passports and fed fake news by Jones. Bibelar and Cabral's tales of these teens and interviews with the few People's Temple survivors show how they lived, loved, and found ways to resist Jones. And then they were gone gives a new perspective on this tragedy and examines how so often the young pay the price for the errors of the older generation. That was a great trailer. Marianne Betterly. <laughs> Now I can't hear you. Uh oh. There we are. Oh, now you can? Yes. Okay. So, are you uh, ready to tell us more about your experiences? I am. I can't hear you again. Hmm. There's not a line. Oh, there we says, are. Somehow Judy keeps getting, somehow you keep getting muted. Are you okay just, now? Yeah, I think so. I didn't okay. touch anything until just now, but. We're on now. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. So tell us more about your experiences. Okay, well, first I want to say thank you to Marianne for that beautiful trailer. And thank you, Mechanics Institute Library, for hosting this reading. And thank you so much, Taryn, for being so helpful. <clears throat> um, I thought I'd just tell you a couple of things about the trailer quickly. The If you remember the face of the man going like, this and he's up in some kind of sports stands and then there's a younger man behind him that was ron cabral my co-author when he was a coach and uh, after jonestown and the jones brothers um showed up for a game uh, for a practice actually and tim who was a really good pitcher and probably would have become a professional if it weren't for jonestown um was pitching balls and that Stephen Jones, Jones only biological son behind him, who's smiling because he knows that's his brother's great love. Thank you again. Um, Ron and I had no idea that the book that started out as just a very small draft that we thought was a finished book um, would turn into the larger book that it became and win so many honors and awards, it's won 10 now. We thought we were writing the book just to honor those kids and so their story wouldn't be untold. But it kept growing and growing and changing as I contacted people for interviews and to read it um, uh, and give me suggestions uh, and to what it is. And I think I'm, glad even that it took those 12 years because it really made it a much richer book from all the help that people gave me, all the stories that they told me. And I'm deeply gratified that people are still interested in this story. Sadly, one half of those who died in Jonestown were in their 20s or younger and a third were under 18, really just children. It's a sad story, yes, 
but it's also a story of their resilience and resistance and spirit. Uh, Taryn, should, I'm seeing you instead of the mechanics. I hope, is that how it should be now? Just wanted to stop and ask. Um, I can put my mechanics logo up if you don't want to see me. Oh, no, no, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just checking in. Sorry, audience. You're doing <laughs> <This> great. <is> <laughs> <new to me. laughs> um, and I wanted to share with you something that Buddy Guy, the great blues guitarist, said. Funny thing about the blues, you sing, you sing them because you got them, but when you sing them, you lose them. And it is really true that in all sad stories, there is a kind of communion because who have not, has not experienced sadness in, or tragedy in their lives? And now that we can see tragedies all over the world every day, we all are a part of tragedies. Um, telling a story does something for the teller of the story. And that's, I think, what Buddy Guy was talking about, because you feel like you're taking action. And you, you understand inside, I think, that you're touching other people with your story or your song or your play. And always, even in the greatest tragedies, there is some kernel of hope, of redemption, of love. And there certainly is that in this story makes me think of the Parkland students who took their grief and turned it into action, trying to prevent more deaths by gun violence. Um, there are several Jonestown survivors who have told their stories, and I guess in a way Ron and I are survivors too. Um, Deborah Layton's Seductive Poison is a really good book. She tried to stop the tragedy by risking her life escaping. Um, and she helped a lot with the book. And Stephen Jones' own wonderful writing is not in any book you can buy, but you can find it on the Jonestown Institute website. And he also was just really, really helpful with me. He's Jones' only biological son. Other People too are working on their stories and I think most of them are almost complete. I'll mention them as I go through. So, because I wanna leave a lot of time for your questions, now I'm gonna get right into the book. Uh, as Taryn said, in September of 77, uh, almost all of the San Francisco temple kids, there was also a Los Angeles temple came to our small 300 student school. Uh, 80 or 100 of them came, we don't know exactly how many because the school district has not released the records. Um, <clears throat> so we could um, match that against the who died list in Jonestown, which you can also find on that website. So they, many of them joined my creative writing class and their poems are an important part of the book. Others made possible the baseball team, the Cobras, that Ron had been trying to start for years. But a lot of the Temple kids, like his son Tim, who was the great pitcher, uh, and other young people were really good athletes, loved baseball, showed up every day, which is something that our other students, many of our other students, not all of them, uh, did not do because the school had been designed for kids who weren't making it, who were truant, who had problems at home, girls who had had babies and weren't allowed to go to regular high schools. So um, they really added something to the school and we didn't mind as we did at first that they came in in large bunches almost all together instead of being interviewed one by one as we usually did the other kids, as we always did with the other kids, 
with two teachers and a student or two interviewing the students to make sure they understood what we would require of them and telling them it was gonna be a lot of fun because we were gonna go on a lot of field trips and we'd cook a whole meal in my cooking class. Um, so we tried to draw them in, but make them know what they had to do, what their part was. Um, they also went to um, Ron's radio production class and were part of that and helped with the newspaper. He had them work on the Natural High Express. Um, then we didn't know it at the time that there even was this um, settlement in Guyana, but he began to draw people out, starting first with his son Stephen, probably because Jones was afraid that Stephen would become a defector. There had been many defectors, and er much earlier there had been a group of college-age People's Temple kids that defected. Um, then Jimmy was taken out, uh, who was on the baseball team. Stephen's love was basketball uh, and uh, many other kids. And I'm going to tell you about Tim's leaving now from the book. A visit from the minister's wife. On the morning of March 27, Cabral was called to Golden's office, that's our principal, where she, she found, he found Tim and the principal sitting with Marceline Jones. Tim looked uncomfortable as he glanced at Cabral with an attempt at a smile. When Cabral, Golden asked Cabral to sit down, Tim looked at the floor, which was not like him at all. Mrs. Jones spoke quietly. Mr. Cabral, we have decided to take Tim out of school as his dad needs him in South America at our agricultural mission there. Cabral thought this must be some kind of error. She just didn't understand. Tim was the team captain, the starting pitcher, and potentially the best hitter. Trying to recover from this surprise, Cabral told her how talented Tim was, a real leader, and that he had even spoken to a coach at UC Berkeley about him. He asked if perhaps they could wait until after the season ended in May. She replied politely but firmly, no, I'm sorry, Mr. Cabal, his dad needs him for now. And you must realize that the work of the church is more important than baseball. Although his father and I certainly appreciate what you here at Opportunity have done for our boys. That's why I'm here since we've already called Jimmy away and now we have to take your star picture. Golden said, of course we understand, Mrs. Jones. Cabral repeated, of course, though his heart did it. He turned to Tim, we'll miss you. The two shook hands. And then I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Mark. He's the blonde boy that you saw in the trailer and he's in the third row on a book cover. Um, and he's the, the first clear picture on that row. All the other pictures, uh, uh, not all the other, the pictures of all the students are two of the same, one clear and one in shadow to indicate that those kids died in Jonestown. Mark, um, his mother had defected from the temple and she was in hiding. We didn't know that at the time. His father remained a loyalist and stayed in the church. And Mark was probably sent to Jonestown as a punishment to his mother and to make sure that Mark didn't follow her lead. In mid-May, Mark came into Cabral's room after school wearing his trademark blue fisherman's cap with a red star. He joined Cabral in the small adjoining bal balcony overlooking Plum Alley. Here's the final layout for the express, Mark said, handing his teacher a large envelope. Well, 
almost all of it. I have a couple of questions about two of the stories and where they should go. Great, Mark, thanks for all your work. And there's something else. Mark's tone changed. You know, my parents have been temple members for a long time. My dad wants me to go to Guiana. He said it would be a great experience for me, toughen me up. Man, I really don't wanna go. I wanna stay here, play ball, work on the paper, draw. Miss Wong says I have talent, but dad said, he wants me to go there this summer for who knows how long. Is there any way you can get out of it? Cabral asked. Anyone you can stay with? No, the only way I could get out of it would be to run away. He took off his cap and turned it around in his hands. I pretty much have to do what my dad, dad says. Um, and Ron tells him to think about what he wants to do when he gets gets back, you know, where does he want to go to school to study art? Back to the book. I guess you're right, Mark said. You know, I'll miss this school. I really love some of the classes, especially art. And some of the kids, he looked a little stricken. And the staff here, you guys really care about us. You're friendly and easy to talk to, different from some teachers I remember at other schools. I enjoyed getting to know you too, Mark. Sorry you'll be leaving. Keep in touch, okay? They stepped back into the room and Cabral watched as Mark walked to the door, stopped and turned back. See you, Ron, he said. And the reason that Mark looked a little stricken was that he had a non-temple girlfriend. Jones had told the kids they weren't even to become very good friends with any of the other students at the school and certainly never tell anybody anything about the church except the good things because the church did do many good works and the kids were involved in that a lot. It was in the newspapers. Um, and I thought I'd like to next take you on a little trip as the trailer did to Guyana. And what I'll read next are the words of Eugene Smith, who was the husband of one of our students at Opportunity, Ollie. Um, Jean lost Ollie and their baby in Jonestown. They both died. Eugene was away at the Capitol. Georgetown because he, he was in charge of shipments there. And finally, after all these years, it took Ron and me a long time too to figure out what we could do. Uh, and you can imagine how hard it must have been for Eugene. But his book, I believe, is almost complete. So look for his name, Eugene Smith. And here's from what he said on the website of his first site of Guiana. And this is Georgetown, the capital, which is far, far away from Jonestown. A third world country, shacks, barren patches of brown grass, people, villagers doing the best they could to survive. I saw the first and last person in my life afflicted with elephantiasis. The people looked desperate and very tired. From Georgetown, where they traveled by plane, mostly from Florida, after a cross country bus trip, the, the temple owned many used Greyhound buses that he used to ship them around. And they left mostly uh, for Florida in the middle of the night because Jones didn't want people to know how many church members were leaving. Most new arrivals made the journey to the jungle interior on the temple boat, a very small one, the Cujo. Smith described the boat trip from Georgetown to Port Kaituma, which is outside of Jonestown, as a wild, scary journey, the deck covered with vomit and Guiana's heat as hammering. The Atlantic is very rough between Georgetown and Jonestown. 
Between April and September 1977, the Jonestown population grew from 65 to 630, a number the settlement was not prepared to handle. Most came in July and August after the New West expose of what defectors revealed was going on behind closed church doors. Most of our students, as well as Eugene and Deborah Layton, both in their 20s when they came to Jonestown, entered during this time when conditions were deteriorating rapidly and horribly. Deborah's description is equally vivid. We sailed out on, into the Caribbean for about 25, the about 25 hour voyage to the mouth of the Kaituma River. The seas were rough and no one was spared the ocean's wrath. We stayed in our places, hanging on tightly, heads bobbing, stomachs croaking. We heaved ceaselessly into the waves, which crashed onto the deck and drenched us. My clothes were soaked with seawater and vomit. Skipping ahead a little. Only eight more hours to go, yelled a crew member as the Cujo entered the mouth of the Kaituma. My stomach settled as we made our way into the calmer river waters. The jungle river was thick with life, snakes, piranha, and curious debris from the rain's torrential runoff. Its root beer colored water swooshed past us, carrying felled trees and other plant life uprooted from the banks. And the young people thought they were going to a tropical paradise to create a model society without ageism, racism, or sexism for the world to emulate. Then this is um, the story of Stephen is coming to Jonestown. Stephen traveled to Port Kaituma from Georgetown by plane when he came in February 1977, although he did end up traveling to and from Georgetown on the Cujo several times later and knew what a long and miserable part of the trip the ocean journey could be. In an article in the New Yorker, Orphans of Jonestown, which you can look up, Lawrence Wright, the author of The Leaning Tower, which won a Pulitzer Prize and many other great books and plays, and he's a musician in Austin, Texas. Um, Wright describes Stephen's arrival in Guiana's capital and his first impressions of Jonestown. After landing in Georgetown, 135 miles from Jonestown, Stephen caught a flight up the coast on an alarmingly rickety plain. Through the window, he could see the jungle stretching endlessly before him. The only breaks in the canopy were vast rivers that cut through the bush. There were no roads, no towns, no human mark visible in the entire expanse. The airport consisted of the strip and a shed with a dirt floor. The sounds of Marvin Gaye's Let's Get It On drifted across the village from a tiny hut that called itself a nightclub. Barefoot Indian children ran up to Stephen and looked at him with fascination. Six foot five with his father's fiery eyes, Stephen Jones at the age of 17 was already an imposing figure. Roughly half of the 50 settlers were inner city kids who had been taken in by the temple, many of them foster kids. And the other half consisted of longtime church members who had the skills Jones needed to build the settlement. The kids were mostly troublemakers in the temple who had been sent by Jim Jones to Guiana either as punishment or to put them beyond the reach of the law because so many were foster children or like uh, Mark had a mother who didn't want him to go there. They were working from before dawn to nearly midnight every day clearing brush 
and it was formidable work, especially cutting the hardwoods, which were so dense they could deflect an iron ax head. They left the fallen trees to dry for months, then ran through in teams of two, one boy carrying kerosene and the other a torch, and set fire to huge swaths of brush. We howled at the top of our lungs, pouring kerosene and lighting fires, Stephen remembers. It was quite a romp. Ahead of them would be a rush of wildlife, iguanas, monkeys, lizards. The ruined forest would burn for days. And while it was still smoldering, Stephen and two other colonists would come in with a bulldozer and push the embers into ravine, a ravine. There would be an explosion of sparks. The boys would come back, their faces black with soot and their hair singed. In this fashion, they cleared 300 acres. And then I'm going to skip ahead in the Jonestown half of the book to chapter 12, which I consider the heart of the book. Its title comes from Debbie Layton's book, Precious Acts of Treason, which is how she described the many acts of kindness and love that people did for one another in spite of risks in Jonestown. When she and her mother came in, her mother was seriously ill with cancer and she believed that Jones would cure her. When the woman who inspected their suitcases, as all were, or boxes or whatever they had with them, saw her mother's pain medication, which she badly needed then, she didn't take it out as she should have. And no doubt it would have ended up on Jones's shelf in his personal cabin, not, um, not used to, to ease her own suffering or anyone else's. Um, the woman just tucked it back in under things as she could have been punished for. The kids did not follow all the rules. They had relationships when they weren't supposed to. There was a relationship committee that really had Jones behind it who said who could be with whom. They snuck out after curfew to be with one another also punishable, um, and the punishments were terrible there. Uh, and some even tried to escape, which was high treason. There's a wonderful part of the book taken from another uh, wonderful writer about Jonestown, um, Julia Shears, called A Thousand Lives, about a kid, Tom Bogue, not our student, although his family was um, in Jonestown. Um, and what happened to him after he was, his, he was chained to a log and his hair was shaved, the other boy too. And it was terrible until Marceline and Stephen intervened and said, you have to let him go. So Jones did. Um, so I'm going to tell you about music and the kids. Um, there were usually the rallies that Jones held at night were punishment se sessions. People were called up on the stage and ridiculed or even punished in front of people. And maybe Jones would go on and on about the wonders of socialism for a while too. But if guests came in, then they put on a good show and the good show was mostly put on by the kids. So it was a chance to have fun, to dance and sing they weren't allowed to dance um, and not be punished. Um, so at one uh, such evening, the Soul Steppers, a rhythm marching and dance group that performed regularly were there. Um, and one, St. Louis Blues was sung by one woman, another woman sang Summertime and Isn't She Lovely? and a girl did a snake dance with an emerald green boa constrictor, which was probably Stephen's pet snake. And our students, Johnny Cobb, 
also the author of a book, which is almost done, I believe. Jimmy, his uh, adopted son, and Calvin Douglas, and Bruce Oliver, all of our students, uh, formed the lineup for a musical group they called Black Velvet. And they had fancy costumes with big lapels because they were good seamstresses in, in Jonestown. And they sang and danced and sing and snap their fingers to Motown music. Although Stephen says that despite their having no time to practice, um, they actually sounded pretty good, though a couple of them were told just to move their lips and dance. <laughs> um, I'm gonna skip over a little bit of that and get to basketball, another form of escape. That, as I said, was Stephen's great love. <clears throat> In one of the shipments from San Francisco, a basketball arrived. Stephen, some of the boys from the Opportunity Baseball team, and several others began to practice drills, seeking out fields in the settlement where they could play. Stephen describes how basketball began in Jonestown in the essay on the Jonestown Institute website called Baby Toes. We threw together a bootleg basketball court in Jonestown because I loved hoop, because Mike could weld, and because we both had just about enough of dad's controlling shape. It was a juicy piece of rebellion that ultimately saved many young lives. We managed to get the floor for a storage and tool room up on stilts as you had to build things in the jungle before dad said we had no money for the walls and a roof. Without walls and a roof, the floor took up about the same area as two Greyhound buses side by side. Now there was a dimension the people of People's Temple would understand. But for us, the precipitous, we made them adventurous edges it was practically ready-made for a basketball court. I can't remember if dad had said outright that we couldn't have a court. Everyone in town knew that he didn't approve of competitive sport. It seemed like we were always trying to see how far we could get before our drug-whacked leader noticed. It was a lot harder for him to take something away than for them away than to snuff it while it was just between our ears. And they even managed to have a forbidden dance at night past curfew on the basketball court. And Stephen says he doesn't know how Johnny and uh, Tim got that together, but they managed to have their dance. Um, and I'm going to skip that part. You can read about that in the book. And last, um, when Congressman Ryan and his party of journalists and photographers and concerned relatives that was the defectors um, came to Jonestown to check it out to see if people were being held against their will, one of our students, Aunt Monica Bagby and her friend Vern Gosney, Gosney were the first people courageous enough to pass a signed note to a journalist, help us get out of Jonestown. And that was a great risk that they took. And once they did that, people who had been afraid to sign up, saying they wanted to leave, began to sign up with Jackie Spears. Okay, now it's your turn to ask questions. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, so that I was looking at the chat, it's been kind of going wild while you were talking. <laughs> um, I, I have a quick question. I thought you referenced a book by Eugene Smith, but, but it's not out yet. I okay, don't know that, the title. Right. Well, I did find it, but um, I noticed that it wouldn't be you published. Did? Yes, it is now in, on Amazon's catalog um, with a oh, really? public. A publishing date of April 23rd and the oh, title great. is back, back to the world a life after Jonestown so um, okay. so good I'm glad that that uh, yeah 
Thank you for cool. looking that up. <laughs> um, so Eliza, I, I wanted to start with this one question, but Eliza uh, Fox beat me to it. She asks, as a teacher, how did Jonestown transform you? Oh, well, it transformed me into working so hard on this book. At first, all of us were just so shocked as most of San Francisco and the Bay Area was, but especially since we knew the kids personally, it was just really hard to take in. And at first, the number reported was 400 dead. It took a long time for enough people to get there to count the bodies. Uh, and um, so it took some days to get to 918. So we thought, oh, maybe that means that some of our kids make it. Of course, they would be the ones to be able to get out somehow through the jungle. But a few people did escape that way, but the numbers were huge. And when you're a teacher, especially in a large school, maybe one kid would die in a car accident or something every year. But, and that was hard enough to take, but so many of them in, in such a horrible way that it really was hard. I guess it just made me wanna reach out more to kids. Uh, and I had, I was already that kind of teacher, but that really, put a red line under how important that is to talk to kids and mentor kids and try to guide them in good directions and try to find out what's going on in their lives that's troubling them. Yeah, it's so important to be a mentor to younger people and to anyone who seems like they need it. Yeah. Um, I saw Manny Blackwell's name on the screen. He's a student of mine. Does he have a question? He has made several comments. He's he's wondering where how Ron is doing, where Ron is. Okay, yes, I should have said that. Well, Ron um, is struggling with dialysis and has been for a long time. And I told him about the meeting and I told his daughter and I was, because uh, I thought he she might need some help for her, but I guess they didn't show up. Huh? Uh, I'll have to check later. Cabral, and then her name is Becky Cabral. But he's soldiering on, Manny. He's, he's uh, doing the best he can. And I know uh, and the book yeah, means a lot to him. Yeah, he responds, thoughts and prayers go out to Ron and his family. Yes, I'll tell him that if he's not here. Uh, let's see, Maria or Mary Julia has a question. She wonders, did, did everyone believe Jonestown was a good place? And that did, did anyone suspect that Jones was out of control? Well, the first hints we got about, I got personally about Jonestown was in some of the kids' poems because all of a sudden this beautiful tropical paradise and little creatures hiding from the storm is one of the lines from one of my students in her poem. So, and she talks about dressing African style in her hair and cornrows and, um, you know, her head up and proud. And so I, I didn't know it then, but I think that was about Jonestown because that was the story Jones told his congregation about Jonestown. And one of the slides that he showed them he, he was holding up a big bunch of bananas, but he forgot to remove the grocery store bag from, from it, by his feet because he'd bought the bananas in Georgetown. He, <laughs> they hadn't been wild just for the picking from the trees. Um, and people in San Francisco, up until that New West article that appeared in, um, uh, the summer of 1977, people thought that the church was this great church with this charismatic leader, and there'd been a big dinner to honor Jones, and um, there were articles about him in the paper, and he took his people on protest marches for good causes, and he took care of animals and old people, and 
got people off drugs. So people thought it was good until that article came out. And of course, the kids didn't know till they got there. So what it what the truth was about it. Hi, Mary Julia. <laughs> Um, Judy, I thought after we go through these questions that um, it looks like there's quite a few students of yours that are mm -hmm. in the audience. And so maybe after we an ask, answer a few more questions, we'll ask the students to to um, raise their hand and then I can turn their mics on individually one at a time just so they can say hello to you. Oh, oh great. Oh, um, but let's, let's, <laughs> let's uh, Let's cover a few more questions. Um, Adrian asks, it seems that you knew defectors as well as victims. Can you offer any generalizations for the uh, two different groups? Well, I didn't know the defectors, some of them until after the book was written and um, I got to know more of the survivors and the defectors. Um, so I didn't meet those people until after. I didn't find out about Mark's mother until after. I didn't even know that there had been this group of young people who had defected. It was, I think, in 74 um, until I started doing research on the book. So I just knew, Ron and I just knew these great kids that spoke up in class and wanted to write for the paper and write poetry and we didn't know that mostly they had to go home and then do work for the church, like go out and raise a certain amount of money or be punished. Um, mm -hmm. So there's a lot that we didn't know while they were with us. And I think it was partly because they really enjoyed being at the school. It was a place of freedom, you know, where they could do ordinary things that ordinary kids did. And um, so I think that and that they were forbidden to tell us anything bad was why we didn't know the, the mm -hmm. bad side of the temple. Um, Catherine has a question, I, I think on your process, she asks, asks, what kind of permissions did you need to, um, to get to, in order to write about the students from Opportunity? Well, I did a lot of interviews uh, with Stephen. I emailed back and forth and, and I asked people for those permissions. And then sadly with the kids' poetry, when someone is dead, you can publish their work. So mm -hmm. that's how that happened. And I had to get, there's a great photograph from um, in uh, the Orphans of Jonestown article um, with uh, Stephen and his brothers, and I had to pay for that. Um, but most of them, I had to pay just a little to the California Historical Society for permission to use those. The California Historical Society is in San Francisco. It's a very interesting place, and they hold all the papers and movies and tapes and everything that related to Jonestown and People's Temple, if you want to do some research there. But the Jonestown Institute website is the best place to go. It's called Alternative Considerations of Jonestown and People's Temple. It's based at San Diego State University and headed by the sister of one a person who died in Jonestown and her husband. Um, interesting. I'll, I'll try to look that up and put that in the chat if I can get to it. Um, there's a couple more questions. Um, George asks, Judy, were you and Ron at Jonestown? No. And no. Okay. And then he has a follow up question. How did the how did the people get the money to fly everyone to Jonestown? No, they didn't fly everyone. They flew special people like Stephen. <clears throat> but most people had to take the temple buses all the way across country in the middle of the night. And then wow. Jones had a lot of money because people that joined the, the temple were trying to be what Jones told them, you know, the old Christians did, you share everything. So they signed over their houses before they left. The older people signed over their social security checks. And then the kids, as I said, were out 
sent out to, to collect money uh, from San Franciscans. And so he had money. That's why it's kind of terrible. He said they didn't have money to build the rest of the house. And people were jammed into those little cabins. So. Uh, maybe you touched on this earlier, uh, but Jolene had a question about how the kids came to come to Jonestown, but you, you kind of touched on how, you know, many of them were marginalized, um, had rough childhood, rough, rough home lives, um, and were vulnerable. No, that, the other kids in our school, the Temple kids, they were, as Carl, one of our students, who is not in the Temple, who said that September, um, that the worst thing that ever happened until September 11th, that day at Jonestown, uh, for him, it was just the most awful day. And he figured that God spared him and his family because they were already, already he and his brother were living in hell at their home, but that most of the Jonestown kids came from really good families, um, you know, kind of salt of the earth, middle-class people working hard, smart. The ones that came all the way from Indiana were very much that kind of person who had to drive bulldozers and build things and farm and clear land. And, you know, they were, they were smart people and uh, it was, they weren't, the adults were not zombies. And the kids were not troubled kids, except probably the foster children. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to point out to everybody that uh, in the chat space, Lottie has put down the, has found the Jonestown um, oh. reference, uh, was it San Diego State University's reference um, collection of uh, Jonestown materials. So it's jonestown.sdsu edu and the link is directly in the chat space. And I uh, want to go to alternative considerations of Jonestown. <clears throat> um, yes, yes. Uh, Thank let's you. see. Um, I'm going to take just two more questions and then we'll go ahead and have everyone who's a student of Judy's raise their hand so that way I can turn your mics on and you can say an individual message to her. Um, but Catherine has a question, if you could read, um, could you please read a student poem, please? And how did you get these poems? Did you, did you read a poem in your reading just a few minutes ago? I no, I just uh, quoted a line from one. And you know what I forgot to bring here? It's just out there, I'll go get it. It's a copy of the book. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> So meanwhile, while she's gone, um, those of you who are a student of Judy's, if you could raise your hand, I'll turn your mic on briefly once she, um, once she comes back and uh, you can say hi to her. This is a group poem written by some kids from the temple and some other kids. And it almost seems as if they were somehow foretelling the true future because they didn't know anything about Jonestown at the time. And of course, the babies who were killed first had not died yet. <clears throat> Better put my glasses on for this one. If there were a window in the sky, I would see spirits of dead in dreams, gossiping gods, spirits of dead deeds, spirits of war gods, thunder gods, spirits of mothers who have lost their babies, weeping like spirits of seeds unplanted, spirits of weeping willow trees, spirits of giant redwoods sacrificed to man's greed spirits of all the helpless things 
spirits of brown grizzly bears, spirits of infants taken before their time. And I'll look for another one here too. This one is by Rory Bargeman, who's also on the cover. The twin of an eagle flying over the jewel blue seas. Here is some of the fruit. I smell the flowery aroma of oranges and lemons. The king flies on. A black panther in his brown trees, an olive green jungle. A king pacing slowly in his land, watching the stone flowers growing. And then this is one uh, by Tim Jones. It's just the end of the poem because he is alive and I had to get his permission, but I never did. But a fragment is apparently okay. I hope so. Actually, Tim died recently, very sadly, before his time of a heart attack. And I think it was because Jonestown was so hard on him. He, he, you may have seen pictures of him holding his hat to his face and identifying the bodies of people that he loved and grew up with. But this is about the girl he loved. Her face is like night that comes and settles down over the world. And one more. Uh, let's see. How do you get from the ghetto to the sparrow? How, in a corner of the ghetto, a sparrow grows lips and remembers how to sing? And that was by Joyce, who is also on the cover. She's in the very bottom row, and she, her face was in the trailer. Lovely person. Lovely poet. Well, uh, that is a, a wonderful way to wrap this up, but I have one question for you before uh -huh. we, um, you have a couple of people who want to say hi to you, but um, what positive messages can people learn from the book, especially younger people who are, who are reading it? Well, I'll give you Stephen's idea about what young people most need to be aware of, which is peer pressure because he describes sitting in the church and Jones saying or doing something that didn't seem right, but he looked around and here were all these people that he loved and cared about and had grown up with, and they didn't seem to see anything was wrong. So maybe he was the one who was wrong. So, you know, to, to be careful to look into things and trust your own feelings. And of course, just don't, believe them right off, but think about them, do what research you can, talk to a person you trust about it. Um, and I think for adults, I kind of said it before, but if you can help mentor a young person, um, just be their friend, just be a person to talk to, if not help them with their homework, um, you know, that's a really great thing to do. And there's a lot of opportunity for mentoring now um, that kids can't go to school and get the extra help there that they might get. All and right, just, well, just the spirit of the kids, you know, they just would not not be themselves. And they fought back, even though it was hard. And if the basketball team, which was already sort of aligning against Joan, and then when they were way at the tournament, they had a chance to be out of the madness and they could say whatever they want whenever they felt like it. And they were determined that when they got back, Stephen said, things will be different. And they were finally going to take on Jones because partly they just thought, well, he, obviously look at the man, all the drugs and alcohol he's ingesting, he's gonna die soon. And he was sort of shrunken and, and sick. But he would manage to get himself together with drugs for the visitors who came. 
Um, and so they decide, okay, no more waiting when we get back. But of course, they didn't get back in time. They, they had been ordered to come back that night, the basketball team, but they said, he's just doing that crazy thing where he scares people called the white knight. You can read about it in the book. And we're not gonna go watch people suffer. We're gonna win the next game, but. Well, thank you. Um, okay, so those, we do have some uh, students of, of uh, Judy's in the, uh, in the attendees. And I was just wondering if you wanted to say hello, um, go ahead and use the raise hand feature and I will call on you um, to turn your mic on and uh, say hi to Judy. I'm gonna start with Dean, uh, Dino, he is here. Hi Dino. He was at Opportunity, but not in the temple. Let's see, let me just, there we Can go. You hear me? Yes. Judy, are you there? I'm here. How are you? I'm good. How about you? I'm doing great. Thank you very much. I, I appreciate everything you've done for me. I know there's not a whole lot of time to talk about, but Judy was my, uh, she was my counselor. She got me into a creative writing and everything else. And I had a wonderful career, 30 years as a police officer in San Francisco. And it could not have happened without Judy's direction and Ron's and Ken Coleman and all, everybody else's direction. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. I just retired last year, April, 2019. No, you're too young to retire, aren't you? <laughs> no, I had 30 years. I'm okay though. I, can, I'm doing I know, something but I still now. see you all as 17 or 18. <laughs> it's, uh, it, was a lot, it was a lot of fun, Judy. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I've been to like five or six schools prior to opportunity and I didn't really get along in them but when I went to Opportunity, I was I was welcomed, no matter who I was, and and I was welcome in open arms, and I really appreciate that they made it different for me. Thank you very much. You're welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> Love you very much, Judy. Thank you. Um, I guess maybe that's the only one, unless Man Manuel wants to say hello. Emmanuel, Manny. Manuel, Manny. Maybe not. He's got to go. Okay. All right. Well, well, I, I, guess, I, just guess. Want, I always forget to say that the book is on Amazon. You can get it through Kindle and any bookstore can order it. But first, go to the Mechanics Library <laughs> and join. <laughs> Let's see. Maybe Dean has one more thing he wants to say. Looks like he raised his hand again. Uh, Dean, I did. Yeah. I think I, well, I think I might have messed up. But Emmanuel, what's up, man? I, I, I see your name over there. I try to say hi to you. But Judy, you, you um, congratulations on the book, Judy. You've done a great job and, and a great interview tonight. Thank you for interviewing, uh, interviewing Judy, and I hope Ron gets better. I've been trying to get lunch with him, and, and he says he has some issues. So uh, too bad. I'll tell him to, to contact you, but it doesn't always work. <laughs> I know. I know. Oh, I he, have he lives up here. Where I'm here. Okay. Hi, Manny. Manuel, are you there? Man Manuel. Maybe not. He's probably. He said he, he was at his he was at his uh, son's house and he had to go. Oh yeah. So. Yeah. All right. Anyway. Well, it was nice nice hearing you your voice. Anyway. Thank you very much, Judy. Mm -hmm. You're the best. <laughs> Continue All right. Looking. Okay. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. All right. Well, um, I guess Emmanuel cannot talk, but um, all right. Well, uh, thank you very much, Judy. We I learned a lot, and I need to read your book. Um, but uh, it looks like. Uh, I'm going to save the chat for you because there's so many private messages or oh, personal right. messages for you. Okay. Um, but yeah, so I mean, do I look at, do I I look will, at it now? Or you... I'll send it to you. Um, oh, 
because we probably should um, sign off because I see there's only a few people left in our attendance and we probably want to cut some of this stuff from the video um, private stuff. But um, I just wanted to thank you for coming tonight and sharing your story and I look forward to reading the book and um, uh, it looks like uh, every, all of our attendees had a great time too. Good, I'm glad. <laughs> thank you so much, Jan, for doing this. You're very welcome. You did the part. I did the easy part. <laughs> <laughs> you just wrote a book, that's all. <laughs> all right, well, thank you, everyone. Um, stay safe and well and dry tonight. It's raining here in the Bay Area. Um, and we'll catch you at the next uh, virtual event at the Mechanics Institute. Thanks so much, and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye. Bye-bye.